Star Wars Joy. Won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to the Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about Meteor. Meteor? Meteor? Like, I'm meatier than you? Yeah. Well, this isn't a, <laughs> It's not the meatiest movie. Uh, <laughs> no. This is one of the few movies that I had never, A, heard of uh, or seen before we started covering it. Nice. I also like the fact that the other movie that you can't stand that we've covered... <laughs> Yes. Hot Pursuit is tangentially it connected is connected. To this movie. It is connected. But I don't think this movie is necess- is not a bad I didn't, movie. I didn't hate this movie. I didn't even dislike this movie. I think this movie's if this movie had John Williams as it was going to have. Yeah. And it had decent special effects, it would have been a good disaster movie. Uh, I think it needed some better script. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of people standing around talking doing nothing. Sure, but it's not as glaring if there's Better no, special effects agreed. and music. Agreed. I mean, a lot of people talking in, with no music, it's a little uh, jarring. And, and although, weird. I will say, I really liked the music in this because it was so 50s B sci fi. And like, it only came on really when you saw that <laughs> it was the meteors theme. It was like, it was like <laughs> little <laughs> speaker attached to the meteors is flying through space. And the meteor was like, <gasps> God, he breathes so hard. <laughs> it's creepy. <laughs> meteor. Well, uh, the world's going to end. Meteor's going to hit us. We're all going to die. It's fun. Good. Yeah. Take yourself back to 1979. Ooh. April 15th, a 6.9 quake affects Montenegro, then part of Yugoslavia in parts of Albania, causing extensive damage to coastal areas and taking 136 lives. The entire old town of Budva is completely destroyed. Yeah. Unfortunately, the construction was an earthquake. No. Compliant. Well, no. I mean, it uh, was pretty old back then. It's not like Budva, they, unfortunately. Well, I'm sure when the town was built, they probably thought earthquakes were an act of God. Well, some people still do. Or gods, don't I they? Guess. Yeah. <laughs> eh, well, I guess. July 11th, NASA's first orbiting space station, Skylab, begins. I just want to point out that earthquakes are caused by the giant turtle who lives under the crust, and when he moves. Okay. There's an earthquake. Okay. His name is Rick. Right. So you're one of those people. All right. I'm a turtler. Great. July 11th, NASA's first orbiting space station, Skylab, begins falling back to Earth as its orbit decays after more than six years. We were all so freaked out. Yeah. We, we, everybody was like, Skylab's going to crush us all. It's going to fall and destroy the world. We yeah. didn't know where it was going to fall. It was, <laughs> Which is funny because it's science. <laughs> well, <laughs> They couldn't figure that out. Well, I think they did, but they weren't very uh, good about Because it was the heart of New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> but yeah, it was a frightening time. The 70s were so weird. So many were. weird things happened. October 16th, a tsunami in Nice, France kills 23 people. Yeah, and they were like, a tsunami in Nice? Not so nice. Yeah. I, you, when you think of tsunamis, I don't think France ever. Yeah. I just think of snobs. I just think of people on a beach and, <laughs> yes. yeah, and the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> people on vacation. Hoity toity. Striking. <laughs> the age of retirement they has reached 62. Throw a lot of uh, rebellions and revolutions and stuff. Yeah, but good for them, though. Yeah. Oh, they, they're, they're, very happy. they're doing something. Mm. Yeah. It's funny how the majority of the world actually cares <laughs> and acts up yeah, when their government know, doesn't do something. They they're also like. going to the right, just like a lot of Europe. It's mm-hmm. so scary. Yeah, yeah. October 19th, Meteor premieres. Bow, 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 or Meteor, depending on yum. your accent. Meteor. That was a, literally, that, that sting was directly from the movie. <laughs> it was. <laughs> So, Meteor starts with producer Theodore R. Parvin, who was inspired by a Saturday Review article by Isaac Asimov about a meteor hitting a major city in the United States. I love Isaac Asimov. He was great. He's a brilliant man. Parvin started his career as a costumer, working on wardrobe for movies like Around the World in 80 Days, Psycho, and A Man Called Horse. Nice. You know, uh, I miss the days that we celebrated very intelligent people like Isaac Asimov and yeah. Carl Sagan and such. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we still do to a certain extent. Mm. You didn't hear a lot about flat Earth back then, or that kind well, of stuff. The only reason we hear about it now is because the internet. Ah, oh, the internet. <laughs> it's just because they have an actual voice now. The great dumbing. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so Parvin got his first producing credit for 1976, The Return of a Man Called Horse, directed by Irvin Kirshner. That was a sequel. That was. Parvin would go on to produce Hot Pursuit in 1987, starring John Cusack. Your favorite movie. <sighs> uh, the movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, the only reason you didn't like that is because of the haircut. You just did not like John Cusack's haircut. No. And that was definitely part of it. <laughs> in 1994, he was the production manager on Wagons East, the film that John Candy didn't want to do but was contractually obligated to do so, and the movie that Candy would die during filming. Yeah, literally killed him. He yeah. didn't want to do it. And it killed him. And it killed him. Yeah. He wasn't in shape to do that movie. He wasn't healthy enough to do that movie. Yeah. No. And they literally forced him to do it. Yes, and it killed him. Uh, very sad. <sighs> Parvin hired Edmund H. North to write the screenplay for Meteor. North wrote the screenplay for the 1951 science fiction classic The Day the Earth Stood Still and is credited with creating the famous line from the film, Glatu brada niktu. Yeah. Famous. Glatu. Famous three nonsense words. Yeah. <laughs> like, what does that mean? Oh, it's... It means peace, you dummies. I... Quit shooting at me. <laughs> I knew about Glatu brada niktu before I even knew what the movie was. Sure. Yeah. But isn't that also... Don't they also use that in Evil Dead? Yes. It's part of the incantation, I it think. Is. With is it is. Not do, but not do, yeah. Nick do. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> it's popular. It is. North shared an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay with Francis Ford Coppola in 1970 for their script for Patton. Nice. I, I totally Patton. forget that Coppola co-wrote the script for Patton. You know... I've seen Patton. Patton's a really good movie. George yeah. C. Scott is brilliant in it. But really, the only thing that I remember from that entire movie is when Patton slapped the enlisted man because he thought he was a coward. Oh, wow. And that's how he got bounced from the theater. From oh, the, how he got kicked out? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Because he assaulted a, a soldier? Yeah. And the way they portray it is he was totally justified because he was a yellow belly. Well, yeah, the only thing I remember about Patton is him standing in front of a American flag the size of most buildings. Yeah, see, I'm Patton. Yeah. And he carried like a... <laughs> really? Yeah. That's what he sounded like. He did... George C. Scott did... Uh, did um, he was... Edward G. Robinson. Edward G. Yeah. Robinson. It was George C. Scott playing Edward yeah, G. Robinson. Yeah, Little Caesar. I'm in, I'm in my... Oh, no, that wasn't even... Ooh. Well, that got weird. <laughs> that got, that got little, weird. This is why I don't do accents. That right. was a little Hispanic. <laughs> that did. They got a little Mexico. Yeah, right? Patton. Yeah. You coward. You coward. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. It's really funny because most of these guys in the 60s and 70s, he's got to like really grit your teeth. Grit your teeth and you're gravelly. I'm Patton. Gravelly. George C. Are you sure that wasn't Scott Charlton Patton. Heston? <laughs> no, Charlton, Charlton Heston's more yeah, like he's this. More, yeah, he more throws it from the yeah. back of his voice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, it's, it's, it's all the gravels, baby. It's different levels of gravel. <laughs> it's, it's just how much gravel can you put in your oh, mouth? Man, yeah. yeah. Jeevers. Uh, North didn't work much after Patton. Uh, Meteor was the last film that he worked on. Bummer. Yeah. North was a president on the of the screen branch of the Writers Guild of America, in which he served on more than 40 committees, including the contract bargaining panel. Well, no wonder he didn't work. That's a lot of committees. Yeah. It's and a full-time uh, job. Yeah. I mean, he was he was making money that way. We probably could use him now to get out of the Writers Guild strike. Oh, please. Yeah. Uh, Just no pay the damn writers. I know. I know. North took inspiration from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Project Icarus. Also known as MIT. Yeah, yes, MIT, thank you. The original Project Icarus was a student project at MIT in a systems engineering class led by Professor Paul Sandorf in the spring of 1967. I used to party with MIT guys. They're not that smart. Yeah. They drink their beers one at a time, just like everybody else. How do you like them apples? Ugh. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it examined methodologies that could deflect an Apollo asteroid named 1566 Icarus if it was found to be on a collision course with Earth. Yeah. Time published an article about the research in June 1967. The results of the student reports were published in a book the following year. Uh, so, yeah, I just find it really interesting that it, it was a bunch of students that were like, hey, we should shoot this thing out of the sky. Yeah. I mean, it seems like something that we should think about since I, I mean, it just killed, allegedly killed all the dinosaurs. That's true. And uh, it's happened before. We're we've, due. We've been hit for a lot, hit by a lot of meteors. Yeah. But like. Billions of years ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. It I know, was, yeah. The odds are very high that it should happen sooner than later. Well, it was closer to the Big Bang, so a lot of stuff was still floating around, and it kind of settled now. Yeah. Settled. Well, and a lot of it, too, is that the moon acts as kind of like a net. It pulls right, in a gravity. lot of the meteors and stuff and, and keeps us from being destroyed. That big old moon that was made by aliens. Yeah. Take that, moon deniers. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Um, Parvin hired British director Ronald Neem to direct Meteor. Neem. My name is Neem. Uh, Neem began his career as a camera operator before making the natural move to cinematography. Naturally. Yeah. Uh, for his work on the British war film One of Our Aircraft is Missing, released in 1943, he received an Academy Award nomination for Best Special Effects. Nice. Too bad he didn't use that expertise on media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he probably watched the movie being like, man, I did better stuff than this 50 years ago. Yeah, four-year-old does better <laughs> stuff on the refrigerator. Oh, oh. Uh, during a partnership with director David Lean, he produced A Brief Encounter in 1945, Great Expectations in 1946, and Oliver Twist in 1948, receiving two Academy Award nominations for writing for Brief Encounter and Great Expectations. Great Expectations is my favorite uh, Dickinson book. Dick's Dickens? Dickens book. Let me I say mean, that it's, again. It's, it's, it is Dickensian. Dickens. Yeah, so I'm thinking of Angie Dickinson. Good Lord. I want to see her great expectations. Yeah, well, watch uh, <laughs> Big Bad Mama. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it is my favorite Dickens book. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's, it's, it's a great expectation. expectations. is fantastic. I like Pip. Book. Yeah. Pip. Yeah, it's good. It was Pip, the best Pip, of Jenny times. O. It was the worst of times. And Mrs. Havisham. Oh, baby. It's had some great adaptations. It's um, handsome, yeah. It has. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't really like the Ethan Hawke one. The one that was the one with De Niro in it, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It was fine. I mean, I don't know. It was fine. It's a long book. <laughs> it's a lot it to is. do in two hours. They just yeah. made another one recently. I think. Was it a miniseries? No, I think it was a movie. I think it was kind of a uh, a, a modern teen uh, retelling or something of yeah. it. Yeah. I just remember Mrs. Havisham trying to. I just, the, the character of Mrs. Havisham, I know this is way off topic. Sure, sure. But the character of Mrs. Havisham is one of the most uh, interesting char- literary mm-hmm. characters. The fact that she was left at the altar and just lives in this museum. Yeah, of, like time froze for right, her. Yeah. And is so affected by it and so damaged by it that she wants to damage all love and all right, right. men from it. I, I can't have it. No one can. Such an interesting character for the time. Yeah. I just think yeah, it was just true. brilliant. Anyway. Sorry. That's true. Didn't have a lot of therapy back then. Oh. <laughs> Come on my uh, Mrs. Havisham yeah, site we <laughs> where, where we discuss all Havishams all the time. Uh, so we're announcing Jim's new podcast. Yes. He's covering Mrs. Havisham. Have a Havisham. <laughs> <laughs> so Neem then moved into directing, and some notable films of his include The Man Who Never Was in 1956, which Ooh. chronicled Operation Mincemeat, a British World War II deception operation. God, that's a gross name. Uh, I believe that they just did a... Netflix just did a movie about Operation Mincemeat, if really? I remember right. I think. I don't think anybody watched it, but it was some. It had a bunch of British people in it. I oh. had, but I think it was based off of Operation Mincemeat. I like British World War II films. Yeah. They're very, like, ooh. Like the uh, Guns of Navarone and Force 10 from Navarone. Oh, and they're not yeah. really British movies, but the two the British leads. I've right, always liked right. the British. Hey, the Brits in the World War II movies are always so cheeky and, and, yeah. and, yeah. and odd and funny, and they've got their own way of doing things. And now... Oh, did you bring the martinis, John? Yes. The, 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 the martinis. They're very prim and proper considering the fact that millions yes. of people are dying. Uh, there's bombs all right. Well, it's tea time, Yank. We're going to have tea and be civilized. <laughs> My tea will get cold. Uh, whatever. I'm going to shoot stuff. Uh, in 1963, he did I Could Go On Singing, Judy Garland's last film. She didn't. Uh, she <laughs> Not wow, too soon, Jim. <laughs> the, the prime of Miss Jean Brody in 1969, which won Maggie Smith her first Oscar. Nice. Oh God, I love Maggie, Maggie Smith, Smith so is much. Amazing, amazing. Scrooge in 1970, starring Albert Finney. Albert Finney. I'm Scrooge. <laughs> Another. He's got a full of gravel in his mouth. Oh, I yeah. love Albert Finney. He's great. Uh, and Scrooge is great. 1970. Uh, but I was honestly, I wasn't thinking of Albert Finney. I was thinking of George C. Scott, who also played Scrooge. <laughs> No, no. Well, he... He yes. played Scrooge. Yeah, he did. In the yeah, yeah, Americanized yeah. version. Yeah. Uh, and he directed the action-adventure disaster film The Poseidon Adventure in 1972. Nice. Check out our disasters. Yeah. Uh, immersive podcast from yeah. years ago. Yeah, from years and years ago. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, Neem would only direct three more features after Meteor, his last being in 1986. For his contributions to the film industry in 1996, Neem was appointed a Commander of the Order of the British Empire, a CBE, Mm. and received the BAFTA Academy Fellowship Award, the highest award the British Film Academy can give a filmmaker. Did he, the films that he directed after Meteor, were they British films? Were they? 
Uh, yeah, and they were not good. Okay, they were bad. I, he, he. So you're saying he didn't deserve the awards that he got? Oh no, every everything <laughs> before that was great. It's just that he was near the end. I mean, by this point, he was like in his 80s, yeah. and he was still directing, and it kind of lost his uh, flair a little okay. bit. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he died on June 16th, 2010, after suffering complications from a broken leg at the age of 99. You know, one thing that I noticed reading this script that you so beautifully put together. <laughs> yes. That these MFers lived a long time. This is not the exactly. same cancer death I know. of Omega Man. Yeah. And well, that's because not, none of them shot movies in the desert. Yeah. I guess yeah. they all survived because they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. There was to, no Nevada. atomic testing in England. <laughs> yeah, they all lived to like 110. It's weird. I that, I specifically started adding it in just because they lived so long. Yeah, they're like hobbits. And not just him, but even like when we talk about Run Run Shaw, like God, that guy lived to be a billion years yeah, old. No, I mean, literally, yeah. more than two or three people lived to 100 in this script. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately for Neem, when he died in 2010 uh, from his broken leg, it required two surgical procedures, which he never recovered from. Because apparently when you're 99, you break a leg, you might die. Or a hip or anything. Yeah. I mean, look, it's you're a fragile. You're just held together by yeah. spit and polish and, and hope. Yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. In an interview in 2006, he jokingly stated, When people ask me about the secret to my longevity, I say the honest answer is two large vodkas at lunchtime and three large scotches in the evening. All my doctors have said to me, Ronnie, if you would drink less, you'd live a lot longer, but they're all dead and I'm still here at 95. Gloop, gloop, gloop. Drink, drink, drink. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I love... <sighs> The fact that whenever some poor bastard turns 100 or over 100 and the news comes to their party where they're just not happy usually, they're just like, yeah. I don't want this attention. Yeah. It's like, and they <laughs> always ask them, well, what's the secret? You know? And every time it just seems like, eh, drinking and smoking. Yeah. You know, it's just basically do not, what you want to do. Don't care about it. If yeah. The more you care about it, the less you chance you have of surviving. Don't worry so much and you might live to 100. I want one of those people to answer... Just don't die. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's basically the only true answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, during the writing of North's first draft, Parvin secured financing and investment from the Shaw Brothers Studio, Warner Brothers Pictures, Nippon Herald Films, and American International Pictures. Uh, $2.7 million of the budget came from AIP. Okay. It was around this time that Samuel Arkoff, president of AIP, was searching for someone to purchase the company. Yeah, I think he was done. By yeah, then. he had all pretty much the last half of the 70s. He was just over it. <laughs> uh, Filmways would eventually buy the company for $30 million, which would be bought by Orion Pictures in 1982, which in turn was bought by MGM in 1999. Yeah, there was a ton of just falling studios. Yeah. Orion uh, it makes Orion made some of the greatest oh, yeah. movies. I mean, the opening. The like three little so stars many. into yeah. the O. And then the O, yeah. The, uh, 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 that movie... Uh, Outland, I think. Was oh, was it, was it Orion? Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. For Sean Conrad. <laughs> Shaw Brothers Studio started in 1925 in Shanghai by three brothers, eventually setting up shop in Hong Kong to tap into the British market. Over the years, the film company produced around 1,000 films, some becoming the most popular and significant Chinese language films of the period. Nice. It's amazing. Their, their production was so high. It also popularized the kung fu genre of films. Oh, yeah, man. Kung fu theater, baby, every Saturday oh, afternoon. Love it. In the 1970s, Shaw Brothers faced a strong challenge from a new studio, Golden Harvest, which had considerable success internationally with the martial arts film Enter the Dragon, starring Bruce Lee. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Shaw Brothers then also began to co-produce films with Western producers for the international market and invest in films such as Meteor and Blade Runner. Yeah. Oof, didn't get their money back on either, even though Blade <laughs> Runner. <laughs> it's really too bad because Blade Runner is a brilliant movie. It is, but it it became more brilliant yeah. as the director's cuts. True, as, as they tooled more as the years passed. But I still loved it. I mean, I remember I, I tell the story. I was in my friend's kitchen looking through the paper because I was going to get picked up by my mom and I wanted to see a movie and she was going to drop me off the theater and see a little square. Harrison Ford, new movie, boom, that's what I'm seeing. Sounds good. And I loved it. Yeah, it's, it's a great movie. E even the quote-unquote bad version is still great. The His gun in that movie yeah. is like my favorite gun <laughs> in cinema history. I don't know why, but I love that gun. I'm not a gun guy, like real gun guy, but I love like video game guns. Oh, yeah. And prop yeah. guns and laser guns. Oh, and yeah, stuff. yeah. Like the, yeah. But he, that gun in Blade Runner, man, is just so cool. With the yeah. lights, and it's so powerful, too. 
Yeah, yeah. It was great. Uh, it was great. I love that movie. They uh, need to make we, a Blade Runner game, man. A good one. Uh, like, yeah, I was gonna say they they have one, but it's not, it's that weird like point and click. I said a good one, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you could totally do it. You could do it with I, you yeah, know open world, and you got your flying car. It's and, and just a matter of time before some video game president of some video game company goes. I love Blade Runner. We're doing this. I want to become a video game president so I can do that. Yeah, well, I would know. love. We should start a video games division so we, we can make the games that we love the most. We easily could. Okay. Right. <laughs> easily? Yes, okay. easily. Then easily. Boom. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a $60 billion industry. <laughs> We're going to break right in. It's, it's, it's as easy as podcasting. <laughs> so Run Run Shaw was the sixth of seven brothers of the founders of Shaw Brothers Studios, working odd jobs for them at the studio when he was 18. His nickname was Uncle Six. He was well known for his philanthropy, giving away billions of Hong Kong dollars over his career. I just gotta say, Uncle Six is kind of the coolest name I think I've ever. No, it's the greatest nickname ever. Uncle Six. It it's has Uncle such Six. a mystery to it. Yeah. And what is with their last name Shaw? It. I assume because they. I think it was the British influence. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I should have looked that up, but I don't know. But that's I'm pretty okay. sure it was the the British influence. Hey, man, you got Uncle Six. That's all yeah. that matters. In 1974, Shaw was appointed a commander of the Order of the British Empire, also a CBE, much like Ronald Neem. Mm. Uh, he received a knighthood in 1977 from Queen Elizabeth II and the Grand Bohemia Medal, the GBM, from the Hong Kong government in 1998. Wow. His wife died in 1987 at the age of 85, and in 1997, at the age of 90, he got remarried. Good Lord. Uh, he, you would think, oh, not a lot of time. No, he lived to be 106. I'm surprised he didn't have a baby. I, I honestly. Like all these weirdos. The, the thing is, is I'm pretty sure the woman he married was in her 80s. She was somebody that worked at the studio for a really long time. Well, that's nice that it was age appropriate. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was more appropriate. Yeah. I think if you're 90, marrying anybody under 80 would just be exhausting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, come on. I would be sleeping a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Well, by this point, North had turned in a draft and Parvin wasn't a fan, so he hired Stephen Bach to rewrite the script. Is he related to the musician? Sebastian Bach. <laughs> the earlier one. <laughs> <laughs> Johann Sebastian Bach? Yes. Not Sebastian Bach of uh, White Snake? No, it wasn't White Snake. Oh. BTO? I don't remember. No, it was, it was either... They did the 18 in life. Oh, whatever. Anyway, Sebastian Bach. Someone can write in and tell us. <laughs> right. So he's not related to either? No, I don't believe so. Uh, Bach was a writer-producer who worked on films like The Parallax View and The Taking of Pelham 123 in 1974. Both great movies. Yeah. Great movies. The Parallax View is one of those great post-Watergate conspiracy yeah. CIA movies with Warren Beatty. And, so good. Oh, my God. It's so good. And then uh, Taking of Pelham 123. Walter Matthau, oh, The yes. Subway. They did yes. a bad remake of it. But see the original. One well, Walter Matthau's greatest performances. Nice. Walter nice. Matthau. I haven't seen it in a long time. Walter Schnabel, yeah, we're getting a Michigan con, whatever his name is. <laughs> we're going to Pelham. One, two, three. Thinking of the Chuck Pelham. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Bach would become the senior vice president and head of worldwide productions for United Artists Studios. He was responsible for highly successful films like Raging Bull, The French Lieutenant's Woman, Stardust Memories, Manhattan, Annie Hall, Eye of the Needle, and Cutter and Bone. Cutter and Bone. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say a lot of uh, Woody Allen movies. Yes, he was definitely involved with Woody Allen. He was in it, more of the uh, arty movies. Yeah. Raging yeah. Bull was great. French, the French Lieutenant's Woman was great. Uh, um, Eye of the Needle was uh, Richard Marquand's first feature, I believe. Yeah, it was a great movie with Donald Sutherland, yeah. um, where he uh, is a rich man trying to get through the eye of a needle to prove that he's worthy to get into heaven. Oh. But he couldn't get through. Because it's very small. Because it's easier for a camel. To get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven, Adam. Right. Okay, thank you for explaining that <laughs> it's proverb. The, it's the plot of the movie. <laughs> he was responsible... Oh, sorry, I just said that. Unfortunately, he was also closely involved in the production of Heaven's Gate in 1980. Uh, he wrote a book about it, unsparingly admitting his mistakes for the film's failures, as well as Michael Cimino, who was five days behind on shooting just six days into the production. <laughs> yeah, that was a mess. It wasn't really that horrible of a movie. Chris Christopherson starred in it. Um, it just was one of the first movies that the behind the scenes and the budget explosion was news. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, yeah, Cleopatra and all those big budget bonkers, you know. I mean, yeah, Cleopatra almost destroyed Fox. Right. But, but yeah. it, 
but it still wasn't this was the beginning of right. people being interested in budgets and right, box right. office and all the stuff that kind of ruined in movies. Uh, <laughs> in those first five days, uh, the six days of production, he shot one minute of film and spent a million and a half dollars. Well, it was a really good minute, Adam. <laughs> it was the best minute of the entire movie. It was. Uh, it was around this time that Sean Connery was attached to Meteor. Attach me. Why? I really don't know why. Because. I... <sighs> Did you see Zadosh? I have really great... uh... Yeah, because why would he then want to go do more sci-fi? Like, that doesn't make any sense. I love Zardoz, and don't get me wrong, we're covering it next month. But he, this character was interchangeable. It could have been anybody. I just, I don't know. It, look, he wanted his Jaws. He wanted his... Yeah, yeah. You know, after, and I know you talk about this, but after James Bond, he just didn't want to do anything that was like James Bond. I know, I know. And this is pretty much the opposite of James Bond. It's just, it's the crankiest character ever. I mean, he's just so cranky. <laughs> Look, there's so many shots of him looking back at the camera, just sneering. <sighs> he just seems so just put yeah. out for the entire movie. And yeah, I get it. But again, it seemed like he didn't even want to be in it. It's like, I don't know why he agreed to it. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm an interesting fellow. <laughs> So his last foray as James Bond was in 1971's Diamonds Are Forever. Diamonds Are Forever. Uh, Despite the fact that the six Bond movies he was in made him an international superstar, Connery was tired of playing the part and was so afraid of being typecast that he took roles that were as far removed from Bond as possible. These included The Offense in 1972, a British neo-noir crime thriller based on a stage play, with Connery playing a detective who kills a child molester during an interrogation. Interesting. I haven't seen The Offense. I haven't either. And and actually, I'm really curious. Another actor from Meteor was in it as well. But I I need to find it, because it sounds fascinating. Yeah. Zardoz in 1974, the bizarre sci-fi film from John Borman, which we'll be covering next month, as I said. Zardoz! Oh my god, I love this movie so much. (laughs) Oh yeah. Uh, The Terrorists in 1975, another British neo-noir crime thriller co-starring Ian McShane. Oh, back when Ian McShane was in his alcoholic glory. Oh, he was great. He's a great actor. He's amazing. He was in an episode of Magnum. Oh, yeah? uh, Where he was just fan fantastic. I didn't know anything about him until Deadwood. Yeah. Like, I, and then suddenly I was like, oh my God, who is this guy? He was, he'd been around forever. He was a big guy in like the 70s and 80s. He had a decent career. He drank himself out of it, got sober, and then came back. Yeah. And then added a completely awesome third act that's still going on today. Deadwood, Game of Thrones, like he did, yeah. Uh, John Wick. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's still going strong. He's so that prototypical, like, it's the older British dude that you're, he's a badass. John Wick, give me a coin. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So Connery would appear in a series of historical epics based on novels from Rudyard Kipling and Agatha Christie, along with based on a true story epics. Uh, granted, he would appear, appear as Bond again in the non-canonical Never Say Never Again in 1983. My friend Phil Volker and I, Phil was the hugest James Bond fan ever. I was a huge James Bond fan as well. And he had some special, there was some special screening in Rancho Bernardo. It wasn't the premiere or anything, but it was like a Weird. special thing. And he and we got, I think my mom got his tickets to it or something. Oh. But we went to see a special preview of it. It was fine. It was good. Yeah, I it's not. It, it's only because it wasn't made by the Broccoli's. Yeah. And, and it was like outside. It was a remake of Thunderball. Mm-hmm. Or, well, not a re adaptation of Thunderball. Like, it was just one of those. And, and literally, the, the title, Never Say Never Again, was because Sean Connery was like, Bond sucks. I'm not doing it anymore. Never say never again. Yeah, exactly. Don't say it. It's a, it was a fine movie. I did, had no issue with it. It was as good as the other Bond movie that came out that year. Yeah. That's true, which, which was, was, I don't know, Octopussy maybe? I don't know. It was either the end of... Mm, of uh, no, because Moonraker was 79, I think. I, I know Octopussy was in the 80s. Oh, maybe. Was I that, don't know. Because I think Octopussy was his was uh, Roger Moore's last. We, I, we I think have, you're right. I think it might be that, because that seems right. With uh, our good friend Christopher Walken. No, oh, yeah, yeah. And Grace <laughs> Jones. Our good friend Christopher Walken. <laughs> Connery would appear in two other movies in 1979. The first great train robbery, the British heist comedy directed by Michael Crichton, who also wrote the screenplay based on his 1975 novel, The Great Train Robbery. It co-stars Donald Sutherland and Leslie Ann Down, and it did fairly well at the box office. It's a really fun movie. Yeah. It's really fun. It's a good action comedy. Donald heist. Sutherland. 70s Donald Sutherland is just, there's nothing better. He's, He's great, just yeah. so good. He plays such a weirdo. 
like in in the Dirty Dozen, and he's just such a yeah. weirdo. Mash, I mean, just a gleefully awesome weirdo. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah. Oh my God, he's so brilliant that, in that. That last shot of his friggin' face. Mm. Woo! No really special good. effects there. No, it's the scariest <laughs> thing ever. Could you imagine being a kid and he walks into your room? <laughs> <laughs> Dad, I said stop doing that. Never. Uh, he was also in Cuba, directed by Richard Lester, an action thriller portraying the buildup to the 1958 Cuban Revolution. Okay. Uh, it flopped, did not make its budget back. Didn't see that one. Nope. I don't think anybody saw that one. Connery, along with Neem, didn't like Stephen Box rewrites, so Stanley Mann was hired to completely rewrite the script. Here we go. He's the man. Uh, Mann was a Canadian screenwriter. He began his writing career in 1951 at CBC Radio and was nominated for an Oscar for his work on the 1965 film The Collector, based on the John Fowles novel of the same title. All right. Uh, Co-starred Terrence Stamp, who stalks and abducts an art student. Ooh. Which is terrifying, because Terrence Stamp is terrifying. Yeah, especially a young Terrence Stamp. Yeah. Yeah. He worked in many different genres, but his best known credits included the horror sequel Damien, Omen 2 in 1978. <laughs> High Wind in Jamaica in 1965, based on the 1929 novel. Eye of the Needle in 1981, based on the 1978 novel by Ken Follett. Nice. Directed by Richard Marquand. Firestarter in 1984, based on the 1980 Stephen King novel. I liked it. Yeah, it was fine. And the sword and sorcery film Conan the Destroyer in 1984, directed by Richard Fleischer. That's the sequel? That was the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. His last film was in 1988, Hannah's War, depict- directed by Manahem Golan of Golan and Globus and the Cannon Group. I saw that. I don't remember what it's about. Uh, I don't re- remember either. I don't know. About Hannah waging war. Hannah and having war. Yeah. <laughs> Man taking over the writing duties led to a Writers Guild of America dispute over whether North should be credited as a co-writer. The WGA decided on giving co-writer credit to North and Man, and I, I believe that uh, North got a story by credit. Uh, but from everything I could tell, they completely rewrote it, so I don't know why he got any credit for it. I don't know. Maybe because he came up with the title. Probably. Oh, is there a meteor in it? It's just like his draft. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so casting, they went on to do extra more casting. They cast Natalie Wood as Tatiana Donskaya. 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 Neem cast Natalie Wood as Tatiana because she was the daughter of Russian immigrants, and she worked with George Rubinstein to perfect a Leningrad accent. Leningrad accent. Uh, Natalie Wood could speak fluent Russian in real life. What? Yeah. Because she was Russian. Nice. <laughs> Wood made a name for herself at the age of eight in 1947, co-starring in Miracle on 34th Street. He really is Santa Claus, Mommy. He really is Santa Claus. It's really funny seeing her in this. I can totally see her. I can see the kid. Yeah. Like, she does not look that different. No, she doesn't. Uh, at the age of 17, she was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for her performance in Rebel Without a Cause. Little Rebel Without a Cause. She starred in West Side Story in 1961. And Maria! <laughs> and Gypsy in 1962. Uh, yeah, of, she played a... I thought uh, you were going to do the snapping for West Side Story. <laughs> yeah, she played a Puerto Rican. I don't know very much about West Side Story. Fuzzy either. memory. I know. I, def- I literally don't think I've ever seen the original West Side Story. No, that's not true. I did see it in college. Uh, anyway. It's not bad. It's not. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. I'm just not much of a musical guy. I also didn't see the remake. Didn't, didn't uh, Spielberg, Spielberg just did. remake I it? Yeah. Ugh. I didn't see that either. I Shit. haven't seen any of his movies. I haven't seen that or the Fablemans. I've kind of lost Fablemans, uh, I think, is coming on streaming pretty it's soon. It's already been on streaming. Oh, has it? It's been on Showtime <laughs> for like the last month. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> that two and a half hour, 245 runtime just makes me be like, ugh. I don't really want to watch Steven Spielberg alone in a room slowly striking himself. Ew. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's good. I don't know. It just seems like... I'm sure it's not, and I take that back. That sounds bad. Spielberg's better than that. He wouldn't do that. No, he's a great filmmaker, but it's just... It just seems a little self-serving to me. Yeah, that's... I mean, that's what I was going for, I guess. And... I'm a huge fan (laughs) of... uh, Seth Seth Rogen? Yes, thank you. Fozzie Bear, Seth Rogen. <laughs> but it's <laughs> just, I'm not a big fan of serious laugh. Seth Rogen. Yeah. No, no, no. Comedy Seth Rogen's fine, but him playing the uncle that broke up his, yeah, Steven Spielberg's yeah. parents' marriage. Mm, yeah. 
So Natalie Wood received nominations for an Academy Award for Best Actress for her performances in Splendor in the Grass in 1961 and Love with the Proper Stranger in 1963. I believe Splendor in the Grass was Warren Beatty's first film. Oh, yeah. I think it was, actually, now that you say that. She would take a break from acting to have a family in the 70s. She only appeared in three feature films, The Candidate in 1972, making a cameo as herself, co-starring Robert Redford and directed by Michael Ritchie. Yep. Peeper in 1975, co-starring Michael Caine. I'm... A peepa. (laughs) I'm peeping at you. And uh, Meteor in 1979. Although she was making TV appearances during this time, finding the shorter shooting schedules more to her liking, appearing in the TV movie The Affair in 1973, co-starring Robert Wagner, her then-husband, and Bruce Davison. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in 1976, a TV adaptation of the Tennessee Williams play. She was great. Yeah. From Here to Eternity in 1979, a TV miniseries adaptation of the 1953 film based on the 1951 novel, the same name, in which she won a Golden Globe for her performance. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know why they did that. I mean, From Here to Eternity was a pretty classic film that won some yeah. Oscars. And- it is, I mean, I get, it's like, oh, it's a TV music. Because they were adapting the, re-adapting the book and maybe adding in stuff that wasn't in the movie. You know? It was also the time where they did, like, Casablanca 2 and yeah, did all these yeah. weird TV movies that was, were just, like, nobody was asking for. No, no, totally, totally. They were dipping. They were dipping back in. Uh, Double dipping. <laughs> little do you know that 20 years later, <clears throat> Hollywood literally only can do sequels now. <laughs> well, they do remakes. <laughs> okay. Yes, better. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, she also appeared in the pilot of Heart to Heart in 1979. Heart to Heart. I love that show. It was great. It was great. He had another gruff, the, uh, the guy that was there. Their, their butler or whatever. He was really gravely faced. Yeah. The hots. The, he was the one that always talked about the hots. Oh. The hots? The hots. Hot to hot. The hots. Oh, the hearts. <laughs> I was like, what are you <laughs> saying? could barely understand what he said. I forget his name. He was this really uh, weird-looking character actor. Uh, Wood's last film would be Brainstorm, released in 1983, co-starring Christopher Walken, Louise Fletcher, and Cliff Robertson. It was interesting. It was a lot like uh, that... Dreamscape, kind of, that movie. With uh, Quaid? Mm-hmm. Randy? Not Randy Quaid. No, Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid. <laughs> it would be a much more interesting movie if the it good was Quaid. Randy Quaid, yeah. On November 29th, 1981, at the age of 43, Wood drowned in the Pacific Ocean near Santa, Santa Catalina Island during a break from production of her would-be comeback film Brainstorm. She was with her husband, Wagner, Brainstorm co-star Christopher Walken, and Dennis Davern, the ship's captain. Yeah. Other than the fact that she drowned, many of the circumstances are unknown. It wasn't me D- well, that did it. Yeah. It was her husband, I think. I don't think he even said that. I I, I don't know. I was sleeping. Uh, it's never been determined how she entered the water. The autopsy report revealed that she had bruises on her body and arms, as well as an abrasion on her left cheek, but no indication as to how or when the injuries occurred. Could have happened when she got into the water. Uh, the autopsy also found that Wood's blood alcohol content was 0.14%, which is just a tad higher than the 0.008 you can get for getting, or point, sorry, 0.08 for getting a, a DUI. Yeah. yeah she she was, had some cocktails. She was very drunk. Uh, and there were traces of a motion sickness pill and a painkiller in her bloodstream, both of which increased the effects of alcohol. The theory is that she was kind of effed up. She had an argument. She went on... To the deck. It was slippery. Yeah. She fell off, hit her head when she fell, and drowned in the water. I do believe that Wagner purposefully did not try to help her. Maybe. I think that they, he was pissed, and it was a, a moment of something, a, a mistake that he's never going to get back. Like, it was, no. you know. Yeah. But it's it just seems so odd, you know. I mean, they were doing a TV show together. They were doing all this stuff together. And yeah. I just, I think Wagner has a, a temper. Maybe. The case was reopened in November 2011 after Danford publicly stated that he had lied to police during the initial investigation that Wood and Wagner had an argument that evening. He initially had said that they, they were fine. Right. She just disappeared. He alleged that Wood had been flirting with Walken, that Wagner was jealous and enraged, and that Wagner had prevented Davern from turning on the searchlights and notifying authorities after Wood's disappearance. Effer. This Effer, don't I, turn on the lights. I... I I could totally see it, just someone making that, tr- like, just getting mad. And then, like, it's like, dude, it's too late. She's dead, man. What does Walken say, though? He did, he cooperated. I he He's never been a... No, no, but I'm saying, like, did he, you know... He was, he was not. He was, like, asleep. Uh, but under, did he say... Underneath. I mean, but 
He would have known if she was flirting with him and would have known if there was a... I don't think he was. I don't think she was. I think it was a camaraderie. They were working together. They were right. in a movie together. It's not like, you know, I mean... You're and, and people are drinking. Pe- four and people. You're, you know, yeah. you get drunk and then people... I mean... Their feelings get hurt. You know she, how people are. She may have, like, touched him for just a little too long. And then Wagner was like, what's this? You know, I mean... Hey, it calm was down. The other thing, too, you have to remember is that they were married in the sixties and then got divorced and she married somebody else and then divorced him and married Robert, Robert Wagner again. Yeah. So it's like, you know, there was definitely history there. That was, there was a lot of that. Very there complicated. was a lot of that. So this prompted the Los Angeles County Sheriff's department under the instruction of the coroner's office to list her cause of death as drowning and other undetermined factors in 2012. In 2018, Wagner was named as a person of interest in the ongoing investigation into her death. I mean, it's at this point. It's it's been thirty years, hey, th- forty years. Is almost. he still alive? I d- actually don't honestly. He's got to be in his eighties. I think he is. Um, I don't think he's dead yet. Yeah. So Robert Wagner's ninety three now. Um, so I, I anything think, will be a life sentence if he gets. I think I think what happened was that uh, Robert Wagner is actually a vampire, and he stole Natalie Wood's youth. Yeah, well, looking at him right now, he didn't do a very good job <laughs> of stealing it. No, 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 no. I. I, I I'm guessing it was an accident and that he was mad and probably she probably went out and he went down and then it was like, you know, she fell over. They heard something they knew, but he was like, oh, you know, F her and was just mad. And then it's it's just those stupid mistakes that you're, you'll you never get back. Yeah. It's, you know? We'll never know. We'll never know. We'll never yeah. know what I mean, happened. Yeah, yeah. Because the only one who really, really knows is dead. Yeah. She died. And yeah. then, you know, I, if Robert Wagner knows, he's not talking. Right, right. But Car- it was, it, regardless, it was a huge tragedy. It was. And I remember it was when awful. that happened. Yeah. She was and a it was fantastic actor. And amazing. And it was highly disappointing that she, she missed out on her third act. Yeah, because she was coming back to do stuff, new shows. She was going to be huge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. raised her kids, was ready to get back into to, to the Hollywood swing of things. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. Very sad. Sad. Carl Malden was cast as Harry Sherwood. Don't leave home without it. <laughs> Malden made a splash in A Streetcar Named Desire in 1951, for which he won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. You gotta stop desiring that sweet streetcar. It's not real. It's not a human. Don't desire it. It's unnatural. <laughs> Have you actually seen A Streetcar Named Desire? Yeah, it's a guy who falls in love yeah. with a streetcar yep. named Desire. Yeah. And, and all his friends are like, you can't. It's he unnatural. Na- he names the streetcar Stella. And he just screams at her a lot. Yeah. Rips his shirt. Uh, in 1954, Malden appeared in On the Waterfront, uh, also with Brando. Uh, Isn't how- On the Waterfront the one with... Stella? No, that is, that's no, the one. No, that, no. I could have been somebody. Yeah, I could have yeah. been the center of the bum that I am. Yeah, it, it, was the, it was kind of the Raging Bull boxing movie, wasn't it? On the Waterfront? Yeah, I thought it was a boxing guy. Oh, no, 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 no. I was, I'm thinking it. No. no, he's like a dock worker or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. He could have been somebody. He could have been a boxer, but he effed yeah. it all up. Yeah. A movie that I should probably rewatch at some point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How the West Was Won in 1962. Gypsy in 1962 with Nat- Natalie Wood. Ooh. And uh, he appeared in Patton in 1970. Patton. Uh, from 1972 to 1977, he portrayed the leading role of Lieutenant Mike Stone in the primetime television crime drama, The Streets of San Francisco. That was a really good show. Was it? Yeah, it was a fun Cop show. I mean, I love seventies cop shows, and yeah. he and a young, beautiful Michael Douglas made oh, a really cool yeah. team. Yeah, co-starred Michael Douglas, who eventually left the series in season five to pursue acting in films. I want to be in films. Uh, for his work as Lieutenant Stone, Malden was nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series four times between 1974 and 1977, but never won. But his nose. Won three times. His nose also appeared in many more movies than him. Yeah, because it always showed up first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Carl Malden. He had a schnozzaroo, pal. Yeah. He had a big old bulbous nose. He did. It's really there. <laughs> it, it is. Oh, I, it's like a, uh, it's like a, a tangelo. I, f- I forgot how big it was, and for the first five minutes he was on screen, I could not stare at anything but his nose. It's distracting. Yeah. Uh, So the show lasted, Streets of San Francisco lasted 120 episodes. He was later an advertising spokesman for American Express, popularizing the catchphrase, Don't leave home without him. And starting most commercials with a, Do you know me? Malden's wife lived to be 102 years old. Lord. And their marriage is considered one of the longest to last in Hollywood, spanning 70 years. Just let me die. 
Just let me die. 70 years is too long. Carl Malden's mother lived to be 103 years old. Uh, and Malden died at his home in Los Angeles on July 1st, 2009, at the age of 97. Aw, too young. Almost made it. Almost made it to triple digits. God damn. That's crazy, though. I'm Good for him. Yeah. Uh, Brian Keith was cast as Dr. Alexei Dubov. Alec Guinness, Yul Brenner, Rod Steiger, Maximilian Schell, Peter Ustinov, Eli Wallach, Tilly Savalas, baby, Theodore Bickle, Richard Burton, and Orson Welles. Were each considered for the role of Dr. Dubov. Oh, would have been great. Oh, they all would have been fantastic. Donald Pleasance was actually cast for the role and filmed a few scenes as the character. Michael Myers. You've got to get Michael Myers. However, he departed the production in order to work on the film Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Well... That's basically <laughs> stepping from a pile of poo into a pile of crap. I would like to make fun of it, but Meteor is not something he should have stayed with. He, it was a lose-lose situation. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, you could... The only thing is Meteor is probably less remembered than Sgt. Pepper's well, Lonely Hearts Cup Band, which to many people is such an abomination. <laughs> such a true abomination of the beat. Like, I... I saw Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band in the theater with my grandma. Oh, wow. And my sister, I think. Wow. And I loved it because I loved the Bee Gees as a child. Yeah. And yeah. every one of my favorite stars, Steve Martin, the, the Earth, Wind, and Fire, everybody, uh, everybody yeah. was in that movie. And I didn't really know much about the Beatles. And I've told you, and this is very embarrassing, <laughs> that I heard some Beatles songs and I was like, huh. They're doing covers of the, <laughs> the Bee Gees. Not quite as good, is oh, it? Oh, no. <laughs> God, you're like those kids that think that all these cover songs are done by, oh, that, that one's done by Rihanna. I was a baby. <laughs> I was very young, and I, I soon was was schooled upon my my right. misinformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a it's an honest mistake. We need to cover Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band because I haven't seen it. Since I was a child, and I'm super I, curious. I've never seen it, so I, it uh, we were gonna have to find. A, we're gonna have to do a musical month. I loved it, and it made <sighs> me cry. It was really sad. <laughs> it was super sad. I remember crying like a baby in the theater. Okay, I now I have to see this yeah. movie. Uh, I never will give you my <laughs> so after Donald Pleasance left to go film Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, he was replaced by Brian Keith, who had been cast as General Adlon originally in Meteor, but then was replaced in that role by Martin Landau. Martin Landau. So we can My thank buddy. Donald Pleasance for Martin Landau being in the movie. Martin Landau. <clears throat> I, I actually really like his character because he's a total tool through two-thirds of the movie, and then he totally comes yeah, around. Like he, yeah. 100% comes around yeah. and, just, and is like, I was wrong. Yeah. Brian Keith was also fluent in Russian. However, he was not of Russian descent. Mm. Apparently just wanted to learn Russian. Interesting. I'm Maybe surprised. He's a spy. He's a commie. He should have been brought up with the McCarthy hearings. He looked young. He always looked young because he had that blonde hair Maybe and that youthful smile. Maybe he learned Russian because of the McCarthy hearings. Maybe. <laughs> it's like, well, if you guys. Maybe he was just preparing for the what he thought was the eventual <laughs> eventual takeover by the uh, Russian well, state. I, pretty soon I'm going to be doing movies only in Russian. So. Duh. Duh. Uh, <laughs> one of his only lines in English in the movie is a toast he learned from a New York taxi cab driver. If the Dodgers. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the movie, Keith's character is given a baseball bat signed by all the team members of the Los Angeles Dodgers. However, the previous line was edited out for television showings due to censorship, which is the version that we watched. The reason for the presentation of the baseball bat just doesn't make any sense. Oh, we watched the TV version? Apparently. Oh, man. Because it was, unless they cut it out for the theatrical well, version, That's why too. it wasn't that good, because we saw the, the watered-down version. We need I, to see the uncut I'm version. I'm definitely not watching the uncut <laughs> version of Meteor. You have fun with that. I um, will. Keith had a career that spanned six decades. He gained recognition for his films, uh, for his work in films such as the Disney family film The Parent Trap in 1961. Yeah, twins. Johnny Shiloh in 1963. Johnny Shiloh. <laughs> the comedy The Russians Are Coming. The Russians Are Coming in 1966. Perhaps maybe where he learned Russian. Sure. <laughs> and the adventure saga The Wind and the Lion in 1975, in which he portrayed President Theodore Roosevelt and co-starred with Sean Connery. That's a really good movie. I've never seen it. It's I, good. Knowing they're both in it, and I, I love Teddy Roosevelt, so I definitely want to check that out. And I think uh, um, Catherine Hepburn is oh, in yeah. that as well. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. 
On television, two of his best-known roles were those of bachelor uncle turned reluctant parent Bill Davis in the 1960s sitcom Family Affair. Uncle Bill! Uncle Bill! Uh, what is it? Uncle Bill! I'm scared, Uncle Bill! Uh, he always, in that show, he always, like, oh, rubbed a his lot face, of, lot of face and, and, and ugh, I hate being a, I hate being a parent. Uncle Bill! Uncle Bill! Just leave me alone, sissy! It's a, it's a great visual gag for the podcast. Buffy! <laughs> well, you could have... <laughs> I explained that I was rubbing my face. Uh, Use your imagination. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, he was known for being the tough retired judge in the 1980s lighthearted com- crime drama Hardcastle and McCormick. Ah, uh, what a good show. Yeah. He also starred in The Brian Keith Show, which aired on NBC from 1972 to 1974. I don't know what that was. Where he portrayed a pediatrician who operated a free clinic on Oahu. Interesting. He got to spend two years in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> he provided the voice of Uncle Ben in the Spider-Man the Animated Series that ran from 1994 to 1988. It was created by a friend of the show, John Semper. On June 24th, 1997, at the age of 75, Keith died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound at his home in Malibu, California. Oh, my God. It broke my heart, man. Because I was such a huge fan. He was one of those guys, yeah. you know, that I've always talked about that I get a talent crush on. Mm-hmm. And I just loved him so much. He was great in... I think he was in the Cannonball Run movies, or maybe it was Hooper. I think he played like the oh, the yeah. the guy that the guy that owned the stunt thing. You know that 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 Burt Reynolds was working on. He was just this larger than life, really fun, yeah, great yeah. character. You knew he was always going to give a solid performance, and he was one of those guys that if he was in the movie, I'd watch it. Right, right. And when I found out, I was so bummed. I was so sad. He suffered from emphysema and lung cancer during the latter part of his life, despite having quit smoking 10 years earlier. He reportedly also struggled with financial problems and suffered from depression through his final days. No. Uh, Keith's death occurred two months after the death of his daughter, Daisy, who also died by suicide. Also, the, the actress who played Buffy on Family Affairs, she either committed suicide or died of a drug overdose. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. At a very, very young age. Yeah. Friends of his refused to believe that he would commit suicide, but no evidence has been presented to refute the coroner's report. Well, it just seems like he had enough. Yeah. You know? They seem to think that, because he had a very large gun collection, that he was cleaning one and it was an accident. But, I mean, not, not like foul play or anything, but they just don't want to believe that he would kill himself. I'll tell you this. Anybody who has a big gun collection is never going to clean a loaded gun. Yes, yes, I agree. Never, ever. I agree. That is I agree. that is such a misnomer. Anybody who knows guns and who owns yeah. guns knows that you never clean a loaded gun. You can't clean a loaded gun because the, you have to clean through the you know, if it's a pistol, you got to clean yeah, through the Yeah, you have to things. go through the barrel, yeah. Yeah, so it's like yeah, the the, the people the that things. that got to go through the things, Adam. <laughs> the people that shoot themselves are guys that drop guns like the Oath Keepers. The Oath Keeper president guy who just now spent 40 years in prison. Yeah. Uh, who shot his own eye out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to shoot your eye out yeah. and you're going to go to prison. <laughs> That's what his parents kept saying. Yeah. And uh, they were right. I, I, I honestly, I, I firmly believe that he was just, he was done. And that was it. Look, his daughter committed suicide. He was dying. He didn't have a lot. Look, everything was just going bad. I get it. I get it. He's yeah. alone. Yeah. He's had a really successful, awesome life. It's just downhill from here. Yeah. Quality over quantity. I understand. Exactly. Martin Landau was cast as General Adlon. Uh, Landau's career began in the 1950s with early film appearances, including a supporting role in Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest in 1959. Yeah, he just kind of looked. <laughs> He's such a bizarre-looking man. And a weird-looking fellow. I love Martin Landau, but he is well, me too. So, this movie, mm-hmm. the two thirds of the movie, he's just such a dick. His <laughs> eyes are so big. The whole thing. Oh, I was supposed to be running this place, not you. Who? Uh, he. His career breakthrough came with leading roles in the television series Mission Impossible from 1966 to 1969, and yeah. Space 1999 from 75 to 77. <sighs> Space 1999. I, I have a love hate relationship with that show. It was sci fi, so I loved it. I had the spaceship, which was a really cool toy. Yeah. It, like, came apart, and it was really big, and the whole ship thing was awesome. But I did not like him. 
In, oh, him in the show? No, he was just... weird looking. He shouldn't yeah. have been the lead. And he bothered me <laughs> so much. He was the one thing that kept me from loving that show. But now, going back, I think I would like it even more because I'm a huge fan of his now. Did but you, as a little he, kid, he, he was too weird looking to be a this hero. Is, this is why he never talked to you at Ralph's. <laughs> yeah. Because he knew you hated Space 1999. <laughs> his performance. He just didn't feel it on you. Well, I think he forgave me. I forgave him <laughs> for being weird looking. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, he earned an Academy Award nominations, uh, two of them, for his performances in Tucker, the Man in His Dream in 1988 and Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors in 1989. Tucker, A Man in His Dream is such a underrated movie. I love that Jeff movie. Bridges. Yeah. It is a really fun movie. If you haven't seen it, it is such a cool movie about a guy that was trying so hard and almost succeeded in creating a whole new automobile. Yeah. It yeah. had so many great innovations and stuff to it. It so was just brilliant. destroyed by the yeah. biggies. And Martin Landau totally deserved the Oscar. Yeah. Now. He's the guy that really came alive in his third act. Yes. He, he, all of those years and years and years of toiling and B movies and TV series and yeah and it, thankless parts. He just finally came out and people were like, Martin hey, Lando's the man. Yeah, uh, he didn't win either of those, unfortunately, but he did win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor as well as the Screen Actors Guild Award and a Golden Globe Award for his portrayal of Bella Lugosi in Ed Wood in 1994. Eddie, Eddie, come here, Eddie. It's such a brilliant Eddie. performance. I need my heroin, Eddie. <laughs> Please, Eddie. So good. Please. He said they. He was so good. I love oh, him. Oh, he was amazing. So much. He was so I love him. Look, he and I, I listen to the other show where I talk about when we were winking buddies for years <laughs> at Rouse, but <laughs> no double entendre meant there. <laughs> no, but there wasn't. It was the most innocent, awesome relationship I've ever had with a celebrity. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I learned to love him after not liking him in Space 1999. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just, it's a certain part. Sometimes it's just a thing. You know? Things, you know, I was used to, you know, Harrison Ford was my guy. Yeah. And yeah. he was no Harrison Ford. No, he was definitely not. Uh, Landau passed in 2017 from hypovolemic shock brought on by internal bleeding and heart disease. Oh, how old was he? Uh, I want to say, I think he was in his 80s. Okay, not 100? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure he was in his 80s. Uh, Trevor Howard as Sir Michael Hughes. Sir Michael Hughes. He had a very small part in this. Yeah, uh, very small because he was on a TV screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Howard gained fame for his role in Brief Encounter in 1945 okay. for his performance that was uh, uh, written by Ronald Neem. Of all, of all people. For his performance in Sons and Lovers in 1960, he was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor. Yeah. Some highlights of his long career. He co-starred with Sean Connery in the 1972 film The Offense. you got to watch that now. I definitely got to see that. He appeared as the first elder on Krypton in the Richard Donner Superman film. Yes, he did. Uh, he played Judge R.S. Broomfield in 1982 biopic Gandhi. Gandhi, you're going to jail. <laughs> that was his catchphrase. <laughs> He played uh, Lord Charles Henry Somerset in the South African TV series Shaka Zulu from 1986 to 1989. He was a South African. Yeah. Yes. Um, throughout his film career, Howard insisted that all his contracts include a clause excusing him from work whenever a cricket test match was being played. Okay. Yeah, he loved cricket. Apparently. He is the most British man ever to be alive. <laughs> uh, look, I need time off to watch cricket. And at 4 o'clock every day is tea time, and I must have my tea. Of, of all... The sports in the world. Cricket is the one I understand the least. Uh, did you see the rider of how many ascots I'm going to need for this picture? 75. I, I, yeah. He declined to be made a CBE, uh, the British Order, the, uh, you know, yeah. thing, whatever it is. The uh, super it, duper Super British, British Order him. thing. Uh, in 1982, one of only 300 people to refuse the honor. Why? Uh, I, I don't know. They didn't say. Uh, you know I, what? I couldn't I, find information. I bet you... From working on Shaka Zulu, he was like, F you imperialists. Yeah. I don't want to like, be a part of this. This is crazy. Although that was after. That was much after. Well, he, he had foresight. He foresaw. <laughs> uh, at the time of his uh, filming White Mischief on location in Kenya during 1987, Howard was seriously ill and suffering from alcoholism. No. The company wanted to sack him, but co-star Sarah Miles was determined that Howard's distinguished film career would not end that way. It Good for her. 
Yeah. Uh, understanding where you come from is important. In an interview with Terrence Pettigrew for his biography of Howard, Miles describes how she gave an ultimatum to the executives threatening to quit the production if they got rid of him. Sarah Miles was a big-ass star. Yeah. People don't remember her, but she, she was, was huge. huge. Yeah, yeah. She had power. He died in January of 1988 from hepatic failure, uh, liver failure, and cirrhosis of the liver because he was an alcoholic. Sad. How old was he? I want to say that he was like in his, his 80s. That's mm-hmm. crazy. I mean, I the body is a very resilient thing. It's crazy how uh, you can ab- some people can abuse their bodies for so long. Well, they also just found out why smokers don't get lung cancer. Oh, God, he was only 75. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which is super young for this crew. And he's like 30 years younger than everybody else who died yeah, in their hundreds. Yeah. But they found out that most smokers don't get lung cancer Yeah, until yeah. they stop. Right, right. So it's like... Keep smoking. You start, you, you got to smoke forever. Well, it seems like it, you know. I, look, I quit smoking six years ago, so I got another four years. until the only old, six years ago? Maybe seven. And but, it uh, just feels like it was much longer than that. 2016, so seven years ago. It's hard to me remember you smoking. <laughs> like I did it for 30 years. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard for me to remember smoke. It's so odd that that switch turned off so completely that I'd never think about it. That's amazing. Ever. That's amazing. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Richard Dysart was cast as the Secretary of Defense, uh, also a pretty small part in this. Uh, <laughs> he is best known for his role as Leland McKenzie in the television series Ellie Law from 86 to 94, for which he won a Primetime Emmy Award from four consecutive nominations. Yeah, Ellie Law was a big show. It was, it was like huge. the St. Elsewhere of law shows. Right, yeah. And Corbin Burns and, and uh, I mean, everybody was on that show. Yeah, yeah. And he was excellent on it. Um, but it was a weird It was a weird show. show. Like yeah. They had a lot of goofy, weird stuff, and Corbin yeah. Birdson was a, he's a ladies' man. <laughs> uh, in film, he held supporting roles in Being There in 1979, The Thing in 1982, Mask in 1985, Pale Rider also in 1985, and Wall Street in 1987. Everyone, a great movie, and he was excellent in The Thing. Richard Dysart passed away in 2015 after a long battle with cancer. Oh. Um, I don't, I want to say, I think he was, I think he was in his seventies. I don't think he was that, uh, maybe a little older. He was probably in his eighties. Yeah. Cause he was in, in LA law. He, he was, was in his sixties. He was older. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was definitely much older. Um, but still uh, cancer, ugh. cancers is bad, but he's our first cancer killer. 70. Yeah. He was like 86. Oh, that's a good run. Yeah. 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 Surprisingly enough, our first cancer killer, uh, probably because he shot a movie in New Mexico somewhere. <laughs> probably. Uh, Henry Fonda was cast as the president of the United States. I'm Henry Fonda. My daughter, Jean, embarrassed me when she went to Vietnam. <laughs> Did you say Jean? Jean. <laughs> Is that what he called her? Jean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, as the president of the Jean U.S. Fonda. <laughs> As the president of the U.S., Fonda shot his major cameo in just two days. He looked old and frail. Uh, yeah, because he literally died right after. <laughs> if you think Biden I mean, looks old as president, watch well, Henry Fonda. He was still great, though. He still commanded the room. Well, he was amazing. I mean, Henry Fonda is Henry Fonda, man. Yeah. He was one of those old-timey movie stars that were bigger than life, like yeah. Jimmy Stewart and Humphrey Bogart. I was he was one of Henry guys. Bogart. I was like, who the hell's that? Yeah, Henry Bogart. Humphrey. Hum- Humphrey <laughs> Bogart. Uh, Fonda made a two-minute speech to the Washington Press Corps, which received a standing ovation from cast and crew, but was cut from the theatrical release because that is what this movie does. <laughs> it makes bad choices. That was a bad choice, yeah. Fonda also played an unnamed American president in Failsafe in 1964, which provided several story elements for this movie. That was cool. Did you ever see Failsafe? Oh, it was like yeah. a live... Yeah. The, the Clooney one? No, the original. The, was the original live, too? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No, I, I saw it, but I mean, I didn't realize it was live at the time. Yeah. Yeah, because I know the Clooney one they did like 10 years ago was the, very much the same way. Well, they did it exactly the same way. Yeah. The book is one of my favorite like nuclear disarmament type books yeah. uh, that I've ever read. It's, it's good. Brilliant. It's a good, uh, if you want to do a, a very depressing double feature, you can do The Day After and this movie. <laughs> Over the course of his career, Fonda was nominated for three Academy Awards, one for Best Picture for producing 12 Angry Men in 1957, Best Actor for Grapes of Wrath in 1940, losing to James Stewart for The Philadelphia Story. Yeah. 
me why he lost me, see? <laughs> he started his, his little Caesar and then went into <laughs> James Stewart. Uh, and he won Best Actor in 1981 for On Golden Pond, the year after receiving an honorary Oscar, assuming the Academy was thinking he would never actually win one. No, man, you old poop. <laughs> what are you doing out there? Are you looking at the loons? You listen to the loons call, Norman? I don't know. I've got Alzheimer's or something. I can't remember things. And my daughter, Jean Fonda, who's an embarrassment. You mean Jean Fonda? Jean Fonda. From, and when she embarrassed me in Vietnam, but I did this movie with her. You old poop. <laughs> He won a Tony in 1948 for Mr. Roberts, a Grammy for Best Spoken Word Album in 1977, and was nominated for three Emmys but never won, robbing him of joining the EGOT Club. Bummer. Makes me sad. He should have yeah, won the Emmys. He should have. Yeah. On Golden Pond in 1981 was his last film, the only film he made after Meteor, although he made like three TV movies after Meteor was released. Oh, man, he was... Looking rough. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, I mean he was great in Uncle Old Pond, but good lord, uh, he was he was old. Uh, he died in his Los Angeles home on August twelfth in nineteen eighty two from heart disease. He suffered from prostate cancer, but this did not directly cause his death and was noted only as a concurrent ailment on his death certificate. Joseph Campanella was cast as General Easton. Uh, Campanella appeared in more than two hundred television and film roles from the early nineteen fifties to two thousand nine, mostly playing. Goombas, mob guys. <laughs> Campanella was best remembered for his roles as Joe Torino on A Guiding Light from 1959 to 1962. Goomba, Joe Torino. Lou Wickersham on the detective series Mannix from 1967 to 68. Mannix, it's me, Lou. <laughs> Brian Darrell on the legal drama The Bold Ones, The Lawyers from 69 to 72. You lawyers are bold ones. He's still a Goomba. Uh, Harper Devereaux on the soap opera Days of Our Lives from 87 to 92. Ooh, that wasn't, that's not a very Goomba name. That was, I 100% saw him in this because my mom loved that show. And I, it would be on when we were home. So I'm Hi. sure I saw him. Nice to meet you. I'm Harper Devereaux. <laughs> Science International from 1976 to 1979. And his recurring role as Jonathan Young on The Bold and the Beautiful from 1996 to 2005. Yeah, he was a, he had a very soap opera yeah, heavy career. Yeah, but he was perfect for that. He did. He, uh, you know, the the soap operas, you know, were the regular paycheck, and then he would go do movies and stuff. He had the time. He narrated the, Dis the Discover Science series on the Disney Channel from 1992 until 1984. Uh, he actually voiced the character of Doctor Kurt Connors uh, and the Lizard on Spider-Man: The Animated Series from 1994 to 1987. Hey, I'm a lizard. <laughs> it's my like, arm got cut off. It's just now in, I'm going to grow it back. I found it fascinating that two people from this movie did voiceover work. Well, he did a lot of voiceover work. He did. he did. Campanella was nominated for a Daytime and Primetime Emmy Award and a Tony Award throughout his career. Nice. He made dozens of guest appearances on TV shows throughout his career, making him an extremely recognizable face. Yeah, and he had a very interesting face, too. He did. Campanella met his wife, Catherine Jill Bartholomew, a singer and dancer in 1963, while, they played, while he was playing the leading man in Hot Spot on Broadway. Okay. They married on May 30th, 1964, and had seven sons, all born between 1965 and 1979, obviously all Gen Xers. Yeah, so they're probably listening to the show. Your dad was awesome. He was. Campanella died at the age of 93 on May 16th, 2018, at his home in Sherman Oaks, California, of complications from Parkinson's disease. Uh, surprisingly enough, it's just a few minutes' walk from Gen X headquarters. Yeah, and our walking tour. Where he, he lived, and his family still lives there. Nice. Yeah. We're going to go drop off a gift basket. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a little weird, but okay. Principal photography took place from October 31st, 1977 to January 27th, 1978, mainly at MGM Studios in Culver City, California, with some location filming in Washington, D.C., San Moritz, Switzerland, and Hong Kong. Yeah, for the, the scene of the tsunami and the scene of the, the avalanche. avalanche. Which, you know, the irony is that they didn't need to go to any of those places because it did not look like they were at any of those places. No. Principal photography was shut down for two days when Sir Sean Connery contracted a respiratory condition during the filming of the mud sequence. I'm having a hard time with my respiratory. We're going to have to take a few days off. The mud also knocked Connery off his feet, buried Carl Malden twice. Has anybody seen Carl? He was buried. We just look for his nose. It's it. out the There's his nose. Get it. <laughs> Grab his nose. Th two hands. And Natalie Wood was almost sucked into the one, one of the pumps. Somebody was... grabbed Natalie. She's getting sucked into the pumps. During the mud filming, the actors and actresses would stuff their ears with cotton wool and had to have their eyes washed out at the completion of every take. 
Take 106. God, I would be so pissed. This is awful. A million pounds of bentonite imitation mud were used to film the New York City subway disaster on stage 30 of the MGM studio. The stage housed a tank and high-speed drainage system, which was used for many of the old Esther Williams MGM musicals that featured swimming pools. Yeah, there was a lot of weird dance swim musicals back in the day, and Esther Williams was quite the swimmer. That's one of those that just it doesn't happen anymore. No. <laughs> they just don't do those anymore. The New York City subway system was constructed inside the empty swimming pool. The sequence took 8 to 14 days to shoot, runs less than four minutes on the screen, and cost around $1.5 million. Well, it is also one of the most exciting sequences in the movie. It's great. I you mean, know. it's it's done well. I mean, the, the, the build up to it, you know, you see it coming. It's like, oh, this is going to get bad. Yeah. I, it, yes. I mean, with all of the tension. <laughs> I, I mean, it's one of the few times there was tension in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> the spaceship that the astronauts were in was actually a model of NASA's first manned space station Skylab. Yes, it was. Uh, the release date was scheduled for June 15th, 1979, but it was pushed back to October 19th due to special effects reshoots after special effects director Frank Vanderveer was fired. First big mistake. Yeah. With most of the special effects budget already expanded by Vanderveer, whose work was not usable and subsequently discarded, William Cruz and Margot Anderson were hired to reshoot all the special effects with what money remained. Which wasn't very much. And then they were also fired and replaced by Paul Kastler and Rob Balak, who were asked to complete the special effects again with what money remained in the budget and just two months before the film's release. Look, Paul, Rob, here's the deal, okay? We had to fire the guy before you and the guy before that, okay? What we got left is about 180 bucks, and we need you to do some special <laughs> effects. Um, okay, um, give me a... A big sponge, you paint it black, and um, some flashlights. You, you know we're just interns, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In order to complete the film on time, Kassler and Balak reused footage from the 1978 disaster film Avalanche, filmed the Hong Kong tidal wave scene in an improvised water tank in Los Angeles using cardboard cutouts of buildings, and used a 22-inch long nuclear missile satellite miniature that was far too small for effective filming. Yeah, all this stuff in space is goof, goofy. Um, the, the, the tsunami didn't look too bad. It was fine. I, I mean, mean, for the time, it looked fine. If there wasn't m many better flooding effects no, at the time. No, that's true. I mean, it's fine. It was the pretty standard. The average sequence was good. Yeah, I mean, it because also had the, a lot of, you know. The reused <laughs> effects from yeah. that Avalanche. movie. It was a lot of styrofoam. <laughs> so much styrofoam. The film was originally supposed to receive a score by John Williams, but he left the project. Uh, no. No, thank you. 100% certain he watched a cut of it and it was like, yeah. I can't do this. Yeah, no. I don't know how to make this good. I do Star Wars, man. Damn it, Jim. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a conductor, not a, a miracle maker. <laughs> not for me. Yeah. The movie premiered on the floor of Meteor Crater in Arizona. This is also the site where the astronauts practiced their moonwalk and where the mothership picked up Jeff Bridges in the feature film Starman in 1984. Yeah, I'm a Starman. Meteor was received poorly by critics. What? I know. Shocker. Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune gave the film one and a half stars out of four and wrote, Let's face it. The bottom line on the disaster film is how special are its special effects. With Meteor, the answer is not very. The big meteor in the picture hurling towards Earth at 30,000 miles an hour looks like something I recently found at the bottom of my refrigerator. Green bread! I think that says more about Gene Siskel yeah. than it does about the movie. Gross. Clean out your fridge, Gene. <laughs> He's too busy, Jim. He's too busy. Just have your buddy Roger Ebert come over. He'll eat whatever's in the fridge. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Uh, Variety called the acting... Uniformly good, but the principals mostly stand around waiting for the next calamity to happen. What really matters to audiences for this kind of film, of course, is not the acting... But the visuals. And here, Meteor gets good, but not great grades. Hey, you know, they're at least being nice. Well, I mean, yes, the effects are awful. But even for the time, they weren't awful, awful. Yeah. You know, because effects were still, not everything was Star Wars, you know? No, no, of course, of course. John Pym of the Monthly Film Bulletin wrote, As effects go. And effects, rather than surprises, or any real plot line, or what the producers have banked on, Meteor looks decidedly old-fashioned and second-hand. It felt like a 50s B-movie. 
It did. Some of the effects were really, really, really bad. Really bad. Like I, the light going across the the screen, the you know, when, yeah. the, when the first meteors came and then they just disappeared. Yeah, yeah. You know, they just looked well, like... Well, and the, the, the space station nuclear missiles, like... It, yes. They were plastic. Yes. It was so obviously they plastic. They looked, especially the red-tipped ones. They looked like a bunch of dog penises. And <laughs> <laughs> they were so bad. And also, it's just not possible to launch missiles that way. I like, I like that this is your sticking point in this movie. But it drove me nuts. You can't launch a missile from a satellite. There's nothing for it to push off of. There's no... Well, the missiles would have to detach, float out, and then use yeah. their thing. If they if they launched from the thing, it would push the, the whole satellite thing back into orbit of right. Earth. Right. It's just... It's, it's physics, baby! Yeah, yeah. Do you think the movie cared about physics? No. <laughs> don't think so. Not at all. On Rotten Tomatoes, the film has a rating of 5% based on 19 reviews, with the site's consensus being... Meteor is a flimsy flick with too much boring dialogue and not enough destruction. At least the pinball game is decent. Yes, there was a tie-in pinball machine released on September 79 from Stern Electronics. Of course there was. It's noting for being the first game to use the SB300 soundboard, which bears no real significance from what I could find in my research. Dude, the SB300 changed pinball as we know it. I thought maybe it was going to be like, hey, they used actual like sound clips and stuff, but now it no? was just the next generation of soundboard. Have. I don't know. They, they did use like... Audio they did eventually. Stuff, yeah. I don't know if this. It might have been. I don't know. But they like that was, that was your your film tie in back then. Yeah. Was they a yeah. pinball machine? Yeah. Would be made. It was of, cool almost, looking. Yeah. I, it looked super fun. Pinball machines are awesome. I love pinball. Marvel Comics published a comic book adaptation of the film by writer Raf Macchio and artist Gene Colan and Tom Paul, Palmer in Marvel Super Special Number Fourteen. Is that no? It's a different Ralph Macchio. <laughs> There's two guys named Ralph Macchio? Correct. Ralph Macchio, the Marvel film writer. He was the head of Marvel for a long time. Like, he... Yeah. Hey, which Macchio am I talking to? Am I Trust talking me. to the Karachi Macchio? <laughs> Trust am I talking me. to the comic book? Karachi Macchio? Yeah, Karachi. You know? Martial arts. Karachi. You play uh, Karachi. I will say that having started getting into comics after The Karate Kid, I was super confused by sure. Ralph Macchio appearing in my comic books. Samuel Z. Arkoff called Meteor the most difficult production ever undertaken by American International Pictures due to the high production, special effects, and marketing costs. Yeah, they fired all the special effects guys three times. Of course it's going to be tough. After the film flopped, the studio was forced to enter negotiations for a buyout from Filmways. The film made just over $8 million from a approximately 16 to $22 million budget. And even in rentals, it only made about $4 million. Uh, it did not make any of its money back. Gosh, a shame. Yeah. Despite all the tepid response and it bombing at the box office at the 52nd Academy Awards in 1980, the film was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Sound. Really? It lost to Apocalypse Now. Good. Good. This is an Academy Award nominated film. Okay. <laughs> it's not a horrible film. No, it's not. It's not. And it's if you like disaster movies, if you like, you know, your Poseidon adventures and your earthquakes and your, yeah. you know, Whatever disaster of the day, it's decent. Sean Connery yeah. is fun to watch. It's fun to watch him just the, being grumpy the entire time. The actors are good. Yeah. It, it's worth watching for Carl Malden and Martin Landau, and and, and I mean the acting. Natalie Wood, like they do yeah. what they can with Brian the script. Keith. That's, yeah, I mean it's it's good. I mean I didn't. I was never bored during it. I mean I definitely enjoyed watching it more with you and us kind of talking sure. through part of it. It's fun to make like, fun of. But like it's but it's definitely worth seeing. I mean it's. It, if you're a Connery fan and a Connery completionist, yeah, yeah, you should definitely watch it. Um, it it it's a fun glimpse into a dying studio yeah. and the end of these disaster films because this was kind of the beginning of the end for these types of yeah, you know, destruction movies. Like, it's it's because of movies like this that. Like airplane was made, right? Because it's like, oh, we got we are in that phase now where we have to make fun of it. Exactly, you, yeah. it, it's become self parody. It's become, yeah, you know, they've done it all. They've done avalanches and meteors and fires and, and floods yeah. and earthquakes and anything you can think of. They threw it at the screen. Yeah, fires, yeah. towering inferno. It's you know, <laughs> and it's it's all all those movies had big name stars from the past mm -hmm. that needed a paycheck. And this was kind of, if you want to watch the swan song, and truly, 
if somebody and nobody will do this because who cares but if somebody would actually put a decent score and redo the effects for this movie it might actually turn out okay i mean they essentially they kind of did with armageddon like the michael bay movie well they yes <laughs> they didn't take the yes michael the michael bay movie armageddon totally ripped this entire plot off they just sent guys to go destroy it rather than using bombs well that and also that other meteor movie with deep impact deep impact came out literally a month later yeah that was when they had the same volcano movies and the same yeah. meteor movies and so is the double the doubles uh, there's the there's the totally over the top goofball one and then the one that they're trying to be a little bit more serious but they're still pretty I, goofball i loved armageddon so much i and then it's part of the reason that i was excited to watch meteor because it was like oh okay it's another asteroid movie like i'm curious what and was so funny about meteor is there's the whole Cold War aspect of everything, too. Yes, yes. And the fact that even with the entire Earth about to be destroyed <laughs> by a giant asteroid, the a-holes in the army are still like, no, we can't tell Russia about our missile thing. Yeah, yeah. And and, and, and then the Russians are like, uh, yet, yet, yet. Yeah, what are you talking we about? We don't, tell, we don't have the no, missile. I don't know. If we did, <laughs> maybe we could do it if we did. I my absolute favorite moment in this movie is Sean Connery, the expert, goes in the room. He's in with all the Pentagon officials, and he tells them what's going to happen. And they just start talking about something else. He just gets up and walks out. And they're like, "What?" And he's like, "Well, I'm done. I'll be down to the ball drinking if you ever make up your mind." It's like he's just like, "Well, I told you what's going to happen. Bye." I've said what's going to happen. It's up to you now. I make a decision. And they did. And it kicked him in the butt. And they did. But, uh, but it was great. It was just that it's like the, the movie needed more of that kind of writing where it was like, okay, we're moving on to the next part. There wasn't a lot of immediacy once they got down to the bunker. Yeah. It was just kind of waiting for the meteor to yeah. happen. And then what happened? Getting everything aligned. And then, you know, we had the whole missile situation where you could only lose so many missiles. Yeah, which that wasn't really made very clear either. <laughs> it was in, and the missiles just randomly, again... Oh, oh, it's just randomly veering off we to the right. Missile. We lost missile two and three. Like, we lost can, missile two and three. I can understand, like, maybe it losing the forward momentum, and it would still be going forward. It just sure. wouldn't hit when it was supposed to. But. Well, it's space, Adam. <laughs> Nothing is going to just fall off. off. I, it's, if something is it's, moving, it's right. never going to stop. That's right. why if a poor bastard, you know, in a space suit gets smacked, and 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 yeah. dislodges. No, they're I, just gonna f- yes. fly forever. I understand how space works. <laughs> well, they didn't. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> they had no, no idea. one that worked on this movie understood space. That's uh, that's the way they kept getting fired. <laughs> Do you even understand space? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you're fired. Do you even understand space? No. I don't. What do you mean space? I don't know. Oh, you're fired. Can somebody please here tell me that they understand space? I understand space. Oh, Rob, perfect. All right, you do the effects. You got six bucks to do them. <laughs> it is. It is really. It is. You're. You're definitely hit the nail on the head. It is an interesting way to see a movie of this kind of dying genre. Yeah. And and in a, in a film studio that was amazing and did amazing movies, and it's just kind of at its end. And it's also at a time where all of these really great actors just weren't getting work. Yeah. Yeah, people didn't care anymore, and so they were doing these disaster movies, or they were showing up on Fat Man and Shaking the Fat Man, or <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Like right. when Fred Astaire would like show up on the Love Boat. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh man, it's like, oh you, you know, sad, poor thing. And Fred Astaire was amazing, and Fred Astaire was great. Was it the Poseidon Adventure? No, no, he was in uh, Towering Inferno, right? Yeah, yeah. so great. Yeah, and it's such a sad part. I mean, it's it, it was so sad to see these juggernauts like Jimmy Stewart and. And him and uh, Richard Burton and all these guys that were just the greatest actors of their time reduced to these ensemble movies about waiting to see how they're going to die and when they're going to die. I mean, it's appealing. I'm going to work for two days. You're going to pay me more than I would get normally. So, all right. Perfect. It was a way to get older people in the movies, you know, a cast of thousands. You know, the older people would go to see Jimmy Stewart and the younger people would come to see... Well, I was going to say Paul Newman, but he was pretty old at that point, too. <laughs> but they would, you know, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. they it was disrespectful. What happened to these poor stars? Yeah. yeah. That they just had to take work anywhere because right, they were right. forgotten. Yeah. And and that's kind of what Hollywood does. Choose you up, spit you out. 
Yep. <laughs> when they're done with you, they're done with you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So, you know, there's a lot of guys that get their careers gone and become bitter old dudes like Scott Bayo or, you know, they're, they're Yeah, they get they get mad and then and then it's yeah. Or they're like Lyle Wagoner and they totally pivot and they start renting out trailers and become the biggest yeah. trailer right. movie trailer business in the right. in, in the right. world. So it's it was a different time. The seventies to the eighties was a really tough time on actors, on really yeah. The yeah. classic movie star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the time was ending. The seventies was all about Jack Nicholson and and, and, yeah, and the other fond young upstarts and these weird looking guys. Like, you know, there weren't movie stars really. There weren't yeah. these good looking. You know, Dustin Hoffman and 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 uh, and Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Great, amazing actors, but I wouldn't call them classically handsome. No. Movie star no. handsome. Pacino may be the closest to that. But yeah, but he was still but a little even guy. Then, but even then, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's know? not, yeah. It's just, in, and because they didn't know what to do with these guys, they just disrespected them. Yeah. And, and kind of just let them disappear. Yeah. Well, well, hey, they at least got some work uh, doing the disaster stuff. I mean. Well, they you know. did. And there were people that, that hired them just out of pure loyalty or just like. Yeah. Like, like, uh, what was her name? Sarah, the guy, Sarah Miles, Sarah Miles, yeah. who was like, hey, look, man, he's just a great career. I'm not going to let that go to waste. Exactly. Like, you know, exactly. There were people that honored them and there were people that, that respected them for what they did, but it's just, it, it was, it was a really gross time in Hollywood in terms of just money. And they didn't yeah. know how to make yeah. money and they didn't know they were in a, in a, in a place where they didn't understand this new wave of cinema like right, apocalypse right. now and the godfather and easy rider easy and rider and mean streets and all this stuff that is getting popular that that were these auteur the yeah. director was becoming the movie star right now right and so it was just a very weird time for hollywood and this is kind of almost the culmination of all of this stuff coming together in the worst possible yeah way. yeah you know? <laughs> all the bad parts of that culmination yeah right yeah. and and you know and a lot of sean connery did not have a very good career really until he did untouchables which brought him back yeah i mean he did yeah after did, between bond and untouchables i i mean he did some stuff that, yeah, that but he, he got floundered around him, but and, and he, he wasn't you know the he, big yeah star. he felt very directionless mm-hmm. yeah and then he as an older man just we rediscovered him yeah. and he had the gravitas and yeah. and and in a, a career defining role in the untouchable this is exactly what martin lando did like exactly he, he he had he did he he didn't ever stop working no but he really started getting his recognition uh, as he got older right and there were the, it, it was the directors like tim burton who loved martin lando right. and right. wanted to bring him back and, and you know like quentin Quint tarantino <laughs> Like Quentin Tarantino, you know, he he revitalized so many different yeah, actors. John yeah. Travolta. Yeah. His career was oh, he, dead, yeah. baby. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had those 18 Look Who's Talking movies, and that was about <laughs> it from the 90s, you know, yeah. from the 80s to the 90s or yeah. whatever. And he completely revitalized yeah. him yeah. and made him into something. It's just, it's really heartening when the filmmakers who love these old actors give them the parts... Yeah, that they deserve. Yeah, yeah, and 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 in Meteor, they're all good. I mean, they all didn't of give them the part they deserved. <laughs> did, well, I know, but they still they're good in the in the movie because they're consummate professionals. Right, right. You know, Carl Malden, Natalie Wood had been acting since she was a child, and she was you know in her late thirties, forty two. I think she's forty two. She's forty two when she died. She died, so like thirty nine. Yeah, 39, so she 40. was pushing forty. So she was in the in the business but she for was, thirty years. She was one of the few child actors that. That made it through and, and transitioned into being an, a, a successful adult actor. Right. Meteor's worth watching. It's 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 not a great movie. It's not a no, terrible movie. No, it's not. But it's also a great Sunday afternoon yes. movie. Yes. You want to get a little bacon. Yeah. You're sitting around on a Sunday afternoon. Wait, is, is bacon bacon? Sure. <laughs> you get yourself some bacon. <laughs> and you get your bake on. And then you get your bacon. And then you definitely enjoy that bacon. But you just sit around on a nice overcast Sunday afternoon. Yeah. You throw on Meteor. You have a cup of beers or something. Yeah. You eat a sandwich. You're going to have a good time. It's, it's available on the streaming, all the free streaming services. It's out there. Just find it. it it's it, it's worth a watch. And I kind of like 
with these 70s movies. I kind of like watching them on the Tubies and the Plutos. We, with the commercials? With the commercials, because yeah. it reminds me of when I watched them as a kid. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's an it's an immersive experience. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, just go ahead and watch it. Um, it's it's definitely happier than the day after. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah, that is true. Um, but yeah, watch it out, and then watch it out, watch it out, <laughs> watch it out, babies. Uh, but oh, we're coming in strong next week. Oh yeah, we're we're wrapping up. We're not wrapping up because we got the stepdad show, but we're doing a little bookending of nuclear annihilation. Yeah, and we're doing war games. Oh, he's still oh. playing the game. June Doom. Shall we play a game? You answered strangely <laughs> last time, but this <laughs> time you didn't answer, so yes. we will play a game. Yes. The game of death. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, somebody that we talked about earlier, um, Walter Metho. Nope. Can't remember. Okay. <laughs> We now return you to your regularly scheduled program, Holmes and Yo-Yo, already in progress.